Let us pray for inspiration. Holy Spirit, breath at the core of our being, you awaken us and you strengthen us, you enlighten us. Please guide my words today. Help me know what I should say and what I shouldn't say. Help us all to hear the message that you have for us. Amen. So as a pastor, I am surprised frequently. I can't tell you how many times people surprise me. One of those times, I was sitting in the front office. It's actually at Kathleen's desk. For some reason, I was there. Maybe I was writing her a note or something in the front office. And, and a man opened the sliding glass door and walked through. And he said, hi, Michael. And I said, hi, do I know you? And he said, don't you know me? Don't you recognize me? I said, no. He said, I'm Bud. Bud, I, I lived out on the streets, remember? And I looked at him and I recognized him. I said, yeah, I recognize you, Bud. Wow, you have really changed. So the Bud that I had met out on the streets, and I'm not sure when I first started talking to him or where I first met him, whether it was around the church or whether it was over by the school, because he, he would sometimes camp in the park. He sometimes camped over by the school. He always had a big cart full of aluminum cans. And I remember one of the times when I started talking to him, I told him that I was the pastor of this church, and then he was telling me that in, in the camps where he hung out, he didn't like it. He, he felt kind of unsafe. There was one person there who burned his Bible, um, and that bothered him. And I said, wow, that is, that, that is a scary thing, you know? And so we, we developed a relationship. We talked, and, and, uh, and Bud, the Bud I do on the streets, was very red from being in the sun. His eyes were yellow from drinking. He was very disheveled, kind of smelly, and... But we talked, and, and then you might remember that you collected aluminum cans for him because he would come by and pick up cans. So the bud who walked in the door that day that surprised me was wearing clean clothes, and his hair was cut. His eyes weren't yellow. He wasn't red from being out in the sun. And he told me that he had turned his life around. He was in recovery. He wasn't drinking. Uh, his sister, who used to let him live from time to time in her backyard, from time to time, uh, actually, uh, he shared her house now, so he was really doing well. And he wanted to say hello to Michelle, I think that was at the time. Michelle was our secretary then. He wanted to say hi to her. I think he might have wanted to ask her for a date. I don't know. <laughs> so, well, she's in Chico now. Um, and then I did run into him from time to time afterwards on my bicycle, and he was on his bicycle. This experience of mine with Bud really gives me tremendous hope. It gives me hope about homelessness, particularly people living on the street kind of homelessness. Because that situation of people living on the street particularly seems overwhelming in our community. There are so many people who live on the streets and live in the parks or move from place to place. I, there was someone this morning when I got to church who was sleeping in the, uh, on the back porch of the office building. We've had people sometimes camping out in the patio here. Sometimes we find hypodermic needles. It's, it's a difficult situation. You could think of it as a problem in our community. And it's really difficult because there's so many interrelated factors, right? Addiction, mental illness, uh, dysfunction. So many of the people who live on the streets in our community are not, not like Dickens' deserving poor. <laughs> They're not the kind of poor folks that Dickens might describe in his novels that they're sitting wearing clean clothes in the park, being very respectful and picking up after themselves and saying hello to people with cherub-faced children. It's not like that. Maybe some people who live out on the streets are, are functional, respectful, etc. But some who are mentally ill yell at you, curse at you maybe. Uh, there's littering. 
And in our community, I think people think of people who live on the streets as the enemy, the problem. What do we do about our problem? Why does Bud give me hope? Bud doesn't give me hope because I believe that every single person out there who lives on the streets can just turn their life around if they really want to. I think some can. Some can. I don't really believe that because of all of these complicated factors. I don't see this ultimate plan, the ultimate solution. Someone wrote an edit, a, a letter to the editor yesterday, you may have seen it in the V, saying that they went to the homeless in Modesto presentation, they heard a lot of things, but they didn't hear a uniform, unified plan. I, I don't exactly see the hope about that. The reason that Bud gives me hope is because I see that I'm capable of caring, that I'm capable of having a relationship with this person, that I actually care what happened to him. I wanted to talk to him. I was so happy to know what was going on in his life. I see the, the capability in me of loving, of love. Love, the kind of love I was talking to Zelda about, the love that comes from God, this power within us that's inexhaustible, that can do more than we can ask or more than we can imagine. That's why I have hope. Just look at this scripture passage today from Ephesians. It's a beautiful passage. And Paul is talking to this community in Ephesus, a church in Ephesus, and saying, you know, you have this incredible power, the very power of God within you. It's the power of love, the power, the inexhaustible power of love within you. And he talks about having Christ be in your heart. May Christ be in your heart. And I think that means Christ's way of seeing with the eyes of the heart, seeing in a different way, seeing with the eyes of the heart. May you know the love of Christ, which is just this inexhaustible love of God within us that can transform you, that can do more than you can ask or imagine. That's what he's saying. It's the kind of love that Jesus had, right? Jesus didn't solve the problem of poverty in his world. He didn't solve the problem of mental illness in his world, which was often thought of as possession, right? When people were mentally ill, they were possessed. Um, he didn't solve the social problems of his world that are still often the problems of our world. But he lived from this place of profound love, this great power of God, and he met people, and he talked to people, and he loved people, individuals, and he gathered them into community and named them as part of the community. You are part of this community. And he touched them. And he loved them. And he healed them. And there are all kinds of healing stories of Jesus, a lot of physical healing stories. But deeper than that physical healing was this healing of love. You're a child of God. You are a child of God. You are my brother. You are my sister. You're not a problem that I have to solve. You're my brother, you're my sister. Now, in Jesus' day, I think maybe there was less homelessness than we have, strangely enough, in the world that he lived in because families tended to tend to their sick, their mentally ill, might have been thought of being possessed. Every, almost every case when, Je when Jesus heals somebody, it's because somebody brings them to him. Someone brings someone who is blind, brings someone who is sick, brings someone and asks for Jesus' love and Jesus' healing. There is one story in the Gospel of Mark about someone who is homeless, clearly homeless. He doesn't live on the streets in one of the villages. He lives among the tombs in the territory of Gerasene. Remember that story? It's a really strange story. He lives among the tombs. 
He's thought to have an unclean spirit because he screams at people. And he has this incredible strength and he's chained there and he breaks the chains and he howls, howls like, like an animal. And then he takes rocks and, and hurts himself, cuts himself, bruises himself with the rocks. And Jesus comes to this person who is homeless, living on worse than the streets. And he, he names this power of legion or whatever spirits within him and he casts out this spirit. And actually, if you remember the story, the spirit goes into some pigs who go over their cliff. It's a really strange story. I can't understand it all. But be that as it may, at the end of the story, this man who has been seen by Jesus, recognized as a human being, my brother, this man is so grateful. And Jesus says, okay, now go back home. Go home to your family. You can be with your family now. They'll... I'll let you back. And the man says, well, I don't want to go back home. I want to follow you. I want to go wherever you go and just go around and bring this love to people. And Jesus says, no, I don't want you to do that for whatever reason. And so what did the man do? He didn't go back home. He just went around on his own, traveling through the territories, telling people his incredible story about the love of God that has transformed him. He knows who he is, and he brings that message to everyone he meets, the gospel. It's beautiful. Homelessness, it's a problem. People on the streets, we think of it as our problem. How are we going to fix this problem? Well, I don't know about that. Um, how we fix the problem. But I do know when we reach down into this great capacity of love that we have and we see with the eyes of our hearts something changes in us and something changes in our world and we take concrete actions, we do concrete things, we can't help it but to express this love somehow. Something great changes in us. I see that happening in Modesto. In fact, I mentioned the program, um, Homelessness, Homeless in Modesto, which was produced by the Peace Life Center. Um, Richard Anderson had so much to do with that, and Richard Anderson in the documentary interviews people who live on the streets in Modesto and others, and he, he interviews people who are doing something to love people who live on the streets. And so I heard a lot of examples of concrete forms of love and doing things. A lot of examples. There's an effort being made for, to create low barrier shelters right now, right? So low barrier shelters are shelters where people who are homeless can bring their pets, their possessions, and their partners. That's been a, a problem for people coming to the shelters. They want to have their animals. They want to be with their partner, and they can't always. So there's a lot being done about that from a place of care. The police chief talked about his relationship with people who live on the streets, creates relationships. He mentioned relationships about 10 times. It's not a matter of just giving somebody to eat. You have to have relationships help to direct people to resources, rehab resources, all kinds of resources, establish relationships that, so that people are connected within the community. Uh, there are other shelters, of course, downtown who are creating relationships, directing people to resources. And uh, Family Promise, Tamara, uh, what's her last name? Tamara Kosinski was there and she talked about the Family Promise program trying to prevent people families from being on the streets. And we are involved in that program. So one person, Brad Hahn, said, you know, it's just the will to do something that matters. The will. And what I could hear him saying, what I saw him saying was, it's a matter of care. If you care about people who are our brothers and sisters, if you care that these people who live on the streets are part of our community, there aren't easy 
answers. There's not an overall solution to fix the problem. But what if we change the way that we see it? What if we see through the eyes of the heart? We take concrete actions. Our church does that. Right? So we participate in the Family Promise Program, and we will be doing, doing that in August, and families will be coming to us and staying in Fellowship Hall. We create relationships with that program, the Family Promise Program. We serve at Interfaith Ministries, the food pantry and clothes closet. People who are not necessarily homeless, though some people who are homeless come in too. Maybe we think about it as preventing people from being on the streets. We, we have relationships with individuals who are homeless because they end up camping at our campus. And it's a, it's a hard, sometimes it's a hard thing. How can I be compassionate? And know that this is my brother, this is my sister. But also say, no, you can't leave hypodermic needles here. Um, how, how do we have boundaries? How do we have conversations? How do we communicate and know that this is our community? We have to do something. If we're motivated by love, we will. We'll do many things. You know, I have another story about someone couple people who live on the streets. I've told this story before. I was riding my bike one day in Dry Creek Park, and it suddenly started raining. It was probably November. I wasn't planning on rain. And as I finished the bike ride, it was getting slick on the surface, and the surface changes from the bike path to the bridge where you cross the creek. And as I turned, my bike slid out from under me. I landed up on the ground looking at my thumb, which was out of joint. I was looking at my thumb and I thought, ooh, that's really gross. <laughs> and I pushed it back into place. And as soon as I did that, there were two guys who, were, who hang out in the park with really big, tall cans of beer. Um, they came rushing over to me and they said, are you okay? Are you all right? Are, are you on something? <laughs> <laughs> now Maggie told me I should have said, well, I was on my bicycle. <laughs> they said, don't get up too fast. You know, take it easy, take it easy. They helped me to my feet. I was kind of wobbly. I walked my bike out of the park. I walked my bike for a while before I rode it again. That act of kindness reminds me of something. Reminds me that those who live on the streets help me, not just by doing something like that, but they help me remember the love within me. They help re me remember that the people we think of as unlovely and annoying sometimes, they're, they're our family, and our family is sometimes unlovely and annoying, right? But they're our family, and we love them. And anything that we do to help them, we do it with that kind of love. And that love will tell us what we need to do. It won't be necessarily about the perfect program or solving all the problems, but it will be a change in us. You know, Mother Teresa served the poor. And in Calcutta, there are lots of people that live on the streets. Lots and lots and lots and lots. And she helped the dying who were dying on the street. So many people dying on the street. She started a home for the dying, and the city helped her out. Uh, they started having ambulances that would bring people to her place. First, they had to take them to the hospital to make sure that this was the last resort and the hospital wouldn't take them. And then, and then she would take the dying. And Malcolm Mutteridge, in this great book, Something Beautiful for God, he interviews Mother Teresa. He's not coming from a point of view of faith, he's just kind of curious about why she does this. And of course, Mother Teresa has, has died now. But she was talking to Malcolm Mutter Mutteridge, and he said, why do you do, aren't they all going to die? These are all people you're not going to really help, right? You're not ultimately going to help. Well, they don't actually all die, but yeah, 50% of them die. And at this point, she'd said she had served 23,000 dying people on the streets of Calcutta. And he said, so why do you do it? You're not going to solve the problem. And this is what she said. First of all, we want to make them feel that they are wanted. 
We want them to know that there are people who really love them, who really want them, at least for the few hours that they have to live, to know human and divine love. That they, too, may know that they are the children of God and that they are not forgotten, that they are loved and cared about, and there are young lives ready to give themselves in their service. That's what motivated her, this love, to give the love of God, to let people know they are loved by God. And, and she saw Jesus in each person in disguise, the least of these. So that's the great gospel lesson for us today from this letter to the Ephesians, this profound love of God, the dimensions of it, the breadth, the height, the depth, of this love, unbounded, inexhaustible. We get burnt out by doing programs. We get burnt out by trying to fix things. We run up against walls, but we can't get burned out when we are reaching for this kind of love within us and letting the people we see before our eyes speak to that love and speak to this heart right here. Sometimes I think when we come from a place feeling like this is a problem or a pain, ah, these people in my way causing me problems, which is kind of a place of entitlement, right? Sometimes if what we need to move from that place is just to say, well, then I must forgive them for bothering me. I must forgive them for pestering me. I must forgive them for making me go out of my way. Maybe if that's what it takes, an act of forgiveness, and that, and that feels gracious to us or something, fine. Whatever it is that makes us tap into this love within us that we have, and more than we can ask, more than we can imagine will happen to us, and to our church, and to our community, and to our world. 